best practices for integrating residential EE and DR programs. A few housekeeping notes we'd like to mention. For best results in viewing the presentation, we recommend using a wired high-speed internet connection, as wireless connections can be unpredictable. If you cannot get adequate sound from your computer speakers, you may dial into the audio portion using the telephone number listed in the right-hand panel of your interface under the audio section. Following the presentation, we'll have a brief question and answer period. You may submit your questions at any time using the interface on your screen. I'm happy now to turn the floor over to our first speaker, Steve Hambrick. Steve, welcome to the event. You have the floor. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, my name is Steve Hambrick, and I'm at Converge as the VP of Strategic Sales and Operations. Uh, prior to Converge, I worked uh, at Opower, and prior to that, doing strategy consulting for the utility industry with McKinsey and Sapien. Um, I wanted to quickly, as we introduce this topic, uh, highlight some reasons why integrating EE and DR programs is a, is a compelling uh, concept. So in some instances in the market, we see utilities that have the regulatory incentives to invest in EE, but maybe long in generation, um, but still value exploring capacity resources, and, and in particular, a timely example is resources that could assist in cold weather events like the polar vortex. Or maybe there's a utility that's uh, investing heavily in DR, but want to make sure they can attract more participants or potentially subsidize program cost effectiveness through EE. Other utilities are looking for ways to uh, improve customer engagement in conjunction with their existing programs. Or probably more than likely, um, a utility is is, you know, is is spread across those three camps simultaneously with a confusing mix of EEDR and customer engagement uh, programs. So um, regardless, though, uh, delivering EE and DR together um, is, is best done through a Wi-Fi thermostat, and this is a really attractive offer for the marketplace. Um, and there's a critical issue I wanted to highlight before we get in. Um, D, you know, as we know, DR is a very specific and time-critical outcome to deliver. So it has, uh, so it's more challenging to deliver than EE and has more severe operational and market penalties if, if a utility or their vendor gets DR wrong or, or the DR doesn't have staying power. So that's one of the critical things we, you know, we want to highlight is you want to make sure as you're looking at these combined EE and DR offers that you're working with someone that has real DR expertise. Um, you know, so you buy your EE from your DR vendor versus uh, potentially someone that's just figuring out DR. Um, so a little overview of Converge as we get started. Um, we, I think one of the unique strengths of our company is that we're an end-to-end -end provider of residential and small commercial demand-side management programs. Um, you know, with the hardware, software, and services uh, to make that happen. But the one thing I really wanted to highlight is our commitment to pay for performance contracts, where we put up our own capital or risk our own revenue based on performance mechanisms um, that we will deliver the outcomes requested through time. Um, and I think that's critical because there's a real chasm between really putting your own skin in the game over a protracted period um, and, and, and not standing behind your work. So that's my soapbox on why I think uh, I'm really proud to be a part of the Converge team. Um, so I wanted to highlight again that, you know, based on the, the time allotted, we focused on residential, but many of these insights also apply to small commercial programs, but not all of them. Um, so we have a lot of experience in both and would be happy to answer those questions offline if you have specific questions related to um, uh, small commercial programs. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the benefits to utilities. Um, cost effectiveness is, is critical, or excuse me, penetration is critical. I got ahead of myself. Um, there are many, there's a myth out there that device-enabled programs can only reach a small portion of the population. And, and in fact, our experience shows that's not true. Um, you can see two examples here at, at scale where we've reached um, approximately 50% market penetration. So when we have lower market penetrations, typically that's more of a symptom of lower goals, lower funding, or a, uh, 
you know, a program design that may not have mass appeal. So I wanted to highlight that first, that with the right program and the right expertise, uh, there's a lot of megawatts out there that you can get in a device-enabled program. Um, we see technology, though, giving us the tools to drive this even further by adding energy efficiency as a, as a in two-way convenience and comfort from a connected thermostat as a, as a way to drive this penetration even further, which we are, which we are currently doing. Another big value for utilities is as the program scales, we need to make sure we deliver, uh, we deliver cost effectiveness. And that can also be impacted by changing market, market conditions as the value of a kilowatt or the KW factor changes with weather and market conditions. So what we see here is that um, at PEPCO, um, you can see our device DR program had a cost effectiveness north of four. And then when we add EE to those same connected two-way devices, we're getting a TRC north of six. So this is a really unparalleled for a residential program, especially at the scale this is. This is a, a very large program, not a, not a pilot cherry picking the most attractive customers. So I think it's obvious that you know, DR and EE off the same program, the same truck role is powerful. Um, and we wanted to highlight some real world examples of those, the, that benefit. Of course, the other part of a cost effectiveness uh, ratio is the cost side. And uh, there's a lot of uh, tools out there that enable us to lower program costs. So I've highlighted five here. Um, these are pretty ubiquitous benefits that a lot of vendors are um, capitalizing on to lower the cost of, um, uh, of, of getting customers into a device-enabled program. But one thing we want to highlight is I'm going to talk more about bring your own device programs in a bit, but DR expertise is critical to successfully deliver, deliver these programs. Um, if someone out there can show me how you can deliver real value to a, you know, in, in the PJM market with a device requiring 24-hour notice, pre-cooling the house, has a two-degree offset over a two-hour event, please let me know. Um, we have a job offer for you. <laughs> so um, knowing how to put all these devices and technologies together in, about, in a way that creates real DR value is critical. And on the EE side, you have similar challenges where um, we know in a lot of markets, uh, just, to, just providing a programmable or connected thermostat is not enough to qualify as an EE resource. So when you're using these third party um, or other uh, resources, you need to make sure we set up a rigorous experiment that delivers verifiable efficiency savings. So I've already stolen a little bit of my own thunder here as we get into um, bring your own device programs. Um, apologize for the slide skipping there. Um, so we mentioned bring your own device as a driver to lower cost. Um, a lot of utilities are in various stages of exploration here. But the big thing that we want to highlight is what is bring your own device success in an EE DR world? Um, to, to us, success means a lot more than just accumulating third party brands or doing a small science experiment. To really deliver on the promise of third-party devices, we've got to increase the cost effectiveness uh, by reducing the cost to deploy a, by, a device, but also delivering real measurable DR and EE benefits that are going to scale. And that's where I think, frankly, a lot of the programs you're seeing in the market fall short on both delivering measurable, measurable results and at a program design that can scale. So on the DR side, um, obviously, you need to be able to control the events, um, but there, there's also expertise that you have to have to be able to value and op optimally deploy these third-party resources. So um, the valuation is absolutely critical uh, because we've got to pay uh, these providers for what value their resources bring to the market, not just a fixed fee they're asking for. So there's some real expertise that's required to be successful. Also, we need to be able to forecast um, the load available uh, and the cost of that load uh, because these devices have various constraints in the way they can be called or the, uh, or the, uh, uh, the, 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 the event properties. And then m and of course, is critical to, uh, to evaluate the, the impact. Then on the energy efficiency side, uh, there's a lot of different ways to get there. Um, some devices 
enable us to control the device with you know to put your own utility branded portal on that on that or a customized portal others offer less control um, so there's a kind of a tier of of utility control on the energy efficiency side that will impact the value and also uh, impact the way we've got to do it and be to measure those savings so on to uh, one other factor is now once we've got these two-way devices in the market and we're doing EE and DR, we're getting a ton of data off the thermostat with or without AMI. Um, so it's easy to want that data. The, the real challenge is how do we utilize it effectively. What I've highlighted here are four of m many, many insights that we can glean from a two-way thermostat. Of course, with AMI data plus the two-way stat, you get a lot more insight into the home. You know, AM, a two-way switch provides less data than the, the two-way stat, and obviously a one-way switch, um, uh, you know, you need AMI to, to, to have a lot of insights about what's happening in the home. But as you can see from these very precise insights uh, we've got from the home that we, you know, we're not guessing with monthly billing data. So we can provide really personalized insights that optimize uh, DR and EE and the customer experience. So. This is an example of a home that you can see when the air conditioner is turned off, it increases at a, a degree and a half per hour. So it's a relatively well insulated house, um, but at this outside temperature, you can see the air conditioner is really struggling when it's on to pull the, the house temperature back down. So this is really important to know. Um, as we're running a DR program, we want to make sure our cycling strategy preserves comfort and load shape. So if we do an offset, um, you know, this home, you know, we won't get a good four-hour event, but if we cycle, we need to make sure that we cycle in a way that doesn't get this home too hot that it won't catch up. On an EE side, same thing. You know, when we're recommending temperature settings, especially during hot summer days, we want to make sure that the home has time to recover before people get home. And then knowing that the AC is not performing well, we can recommend things like an AC tune-up. Um, or other programs. Um, optimized DR is something really near and dear to my heart because I want to see DR move up the resource stack. And, and we do that by delivering more precise outcomes, as you see on the right. Where we, like in PJM, for example, our devices qualify for sink reserve. Um, you, we can deliver more precise load shape to mitigate uh, renewables. There's a lot of uh, more surgical, location-sensitive outcomes we can deliver. And then on the EE side, Having all this data that we accumulate on the left, again, enables us to deliver more personalized, relevant insights to homeowners. So to me, this is all about moving DR up the value stack and giving us more valuable DR instead of, um, instead of you know, some of, the, some of the less valuable behavioral DR you're seeing in the market now. Now um, we're going to quickly put our customer hats on. Um, customer confusion. A major issue in the marketplace. Um, to misquote George, the philosopher George Carlin, um, think about how disinterested in energy the average person is, then realize 50 percent 50 of people care even less than that. <laughs> so we've got to make sure that our message is clear and consistent. These are five common programs you'll see in the market that can all be served by one third-party uh, thermostat EE DR program. So um, when you're when you're dealing with uh, simplification, uh, there's a, there's a critical choice element that all this technology offers, but it's also critical not to give so much choice that you drive confusion, and that's really where the art and the experience comes in. So customers can have a choice of a switch or a thermostat. Um, a lot of brands of thermostats, they can choose which channel to engage with, and then there's also uh, control strategies in terms of how we design the program and what incentives we provide. So there's a lot of optionality here. Um, the key is doing this without, um, without creating confusion. So I wanted to just show, um, you know, when we're talking about from the customer driving participation and, and ongoing engagement with these programs, um, we, uh, I hope these are rendering on your screens uh, well. But we're showing, you know, on the left, a mobile interface to control the thermostat. In the middle, uh, some energy insights that can be served up uh, on, you know, on various devices to the customer. And then on the right, uh, a basic scheduling interface that customers can use to uh, easily uh, manage the schedule of their home. 
So this is all about that convenience, which can be a, a carrot to draw people into the program and keep them engaged. Then, um, and deliver measurable efficiency savings, of course. And then as we look at a DR interface, we can notify customers during an event. Um, this can reduce frustration um, and reduce calls to the call center. And of course, it's all customizable. So um, you can choose to uh, not proactively notify customers in a, of an event, but when they go to check the thermostat, they can learn about the event and be informed. Um, personalized, relevant, and actionable advice. This is also near and dear to my heart because we've got so much data off the thermostat that we can deliver a much stronger experience and, and, and better EE. So as we showed from the triangle, we, we can build a thermodynamic model of the home, even based on monthly billing data. Our recommendations don't have to be generic because we know what's happening in the home. And when we give those recommendations, we can give precise estimates of how much energy you're going to save. No more kind of generic up to language. Um, and then the actionable recommendations is really important to me because this enables customers to take the tip and, as you can see from the example there, immediately choose to act on it and change the setting on the thermostat. And that gives us, um, you know, there's no gap from, you know, processing the insight to acting on it. Um, so you're going to get more adoption. And then um, we also get real data about how customers react with that tip so we can optimize the program. Um, and also, this opens up more positive engagement channels, so uh, we can avoid uh, some of the collateral damage you get from broad opt-out messaging. I've already mentioned uh, the, the different incentives that we can provide uh, with this uh, real, near real-time data. And so there's a lot of benefits to these in terms of uh, you know, paying participants for what they actually deliver, uh, so uh, closing some of the inefficiencies in the market. So the ISOs and RTOs are imposing market constraints. We can pass those down through the value chain and, it'll, and pay people for the value they deliver. Um, but there's a lot of models in between that and just a flat annual incentive that can all be explored. I'm going to turn it now. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to hit a couple of case studies quickly. Um, these are two programs that that launched last year. Um, uh, Duke Energy. So we have a, a thermostat program where we have HVAC control over uh, mobile and web interface. We're delivering personalized tips um, uh, targeting EE and DR impact. So this is a really exciting program that's growing uh, at Duke. And then at Fort Collins, we have a uh, Peak Partners program that we also launched last year. Um, this is you know, an interesting twist here. This is a, a thermostat and switch program, which we find the option of both definitely drives higher participation and we can use the switch for different outcomes like water heating. Fort Collins also is doing a lot of really advanced uh, innovative things around predicting load, predicting coincident peak um, that, I, that it's going to, uh, this is the direction we think DR is going to go and is going to move it up the value stack. Okay, now I'm turning it over to Praveen. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Praveen Bhagat. Um, I'm the uh, Vice President of Marketing at Converge, uh, where I've led the consumer marketing practice uh, focused specifically uh, on the energy sector for about 10 years now. I'm going into 2015, we have enrolled over uh, 1.6 million customers in a variety of demand response and energy efficiency programs uh, throughout the country. Um, Steve uh, just talked about uh, the two recent case studies and while these two programs um, share several basic characteristics, uh, there was a significant dynamic difference which will be relevant uh, to our discussion uh, of the program design. So um, talking about program design, uh, if we go to the next slide. We'll share five key insights um, that we have identified specifically related to the integrated DR and energy efficiency space. Um, these insights are not only um, derived from um, our relationship with Fort Collins and Duke Energy, um, but also from other utilities across the country we have worked with or consulted with over the last few years. So the first one here is augment versus initiate. Um, the second one is uh, role of offer complexity and uh, program rules. Um, 
Next is incentives versus costs and the trade-offs therein. Uh, need for transparency. Um, and finally, uh, we'll talk about um, the role of uh, the marketing mix. Uh, not to say there couldn't be other factors that may be relevant um, in a certain utility footprint, but we have identified these five key insights that come into play the most. So if you go to the next slide, let's talk about the first insight. And uh, it is about focusing on customer experience, really, um, as you build a more complex offer, DR plus EE makes it a little more complex. Um, Fort Collins had an existing uh, switch-based uh, demand response um, program um, called Hot Shots that they um, ended. Um, those uh, DR customers were then offered the option to migrate to the integrated DR and EE program um, called uh, uh, Peak Partners. We thus had to um, approach the program as an augmentation um, of the existing program uh, at least from a customer experience standpoint. Duke didn't have uh, an existing integrated DREE program in Ohio. There, Duke had to initiate uh, their home energy manager from the framework of a new program launch. Some other utilities look to grandfather um, existing customers as they launch new programs, and over time, bring the embedded base to the new program. Um, this approach probably enables a phased approach, but eventually they would bring the embedded base that has been grandfathered over uh, at some point in time. Now, of course, the risk of churn increases as new programs are introduced. Um, but for the most part, if the program is structured well, uh, enrollments, participation, and migration go smoothly. Uh, the challenge, of course, is how you communicate to your customers. Uh, the level of details and explanation will vary. Um, when, uh, where customers have been uh, familiar with an existing program, the embedded base is familiar with core concepts and goals um, and primarily need to be educated on the new um, elements of the new offer. Uh, this has been the case um, in Fort Collins, uh, at least for the embedded base uh, uh, of customers. Uh, for new programs and new customers, um, I think a key thing to keep in mind is um, both DR and EE concepts have to be explained, um, which was uh, the case um, in um, Duke, and uh, also for Fort Collins as they brought in, uh, as they targeted new acquisitions. Um, in the slide, we see that under um, Augment existing program, there are fewer marketing pieces or elements um, versus uh, the new program. Uh, the key is to still remain comprehensive, even if there are fewer elements. You got to be comprehensive and let customers know, you know, the complete um, approach uh, of, of what are the components of that. Um, and, and certainly, there is complexity at play here. So, if you go to the next slide, um, we talk about um, the offer complexity, and uh, especially when designing a program um, and in coordination with your regulatory authorities. Um, there will be rules that need to be established relative to who can participate based on a variety of uh, criteria. Uh, it could be average monthly usage. Um, some utilities, uh, especially in um, open markets, they have to use or they use credit score, um, usage history, um, whether to target single family homes or multi-dwelling units, a number of devices that are allowed. For example, if uh, you have two central AC units, would you want both of them to participate in a program or only one can participate? So those are some of the nuances and rules that have to be teased out and um, upfront. Um, customer permission to opt out is another example. Um, if there is an existing um, program uh, or there is an overlap, um, how will we handle that conflict um, with that existing program? And of course, there could be other considerations as well uh, that may come into play, such as um, economic fairness issues when offering a uh, some kind of a financial incentive. So I think the point here is really that we the offer is complex, but really we have to utilize superior targeting. The utilities have data to be able to figure out who to target, um, and that would avoid customer dissatisfaction. And the point really is 
you really don't want customers to go call the call center or go through um, a series of questions to figure out that they are not qualified. They need to get to the point rather quickly. Okay, so if we go to the next slide. Steve briefly talked about the appropriate incentive levels and you know certainly we don't want to overpay uh, but we also want sufficient incentive. Um, and I guess one thing I'd like to say before we move forward is some of us may be familiar with the um, old concept of IDSM, the Integrated Demand Side Management, um, specifically in the CNI space. And essentially what it was and is, is that DR incentives fund energy efficiency costs. That's the core concept. I mean, there are other elements in that as well. but. But that's the point that we're talking about in, in this particular slide. Um, in the integrated DREE uh, programs, uh, you know, these are relatively new in the residential space. Some utilities have played in it in the past and you know, have now started getting more traction. But I think what we find is that there is, um, seems to be at least, a more of a trial and error approach. Um, one more reason we wanted to address this issue during this webinar. So one component um, in question seems to be how to handle program costs. Should they be assumed directly by the customer? Here's one of our learnings. Passing on costs to customers inhibits program participation. Um, case in point, um, one Texas utility has been charging a monthly fee for program participation in their demand response and energy efficiency program. It's an integrated program. And the result is that participation rates are much lower than what we have seen in programs that don't have fees. And these learnings are consistent across the country. Um, and of course, we understand um, the impulse to impose fees for cost effectiveness reasons, um, given that there are costs for uh, equipment, and there are apps that are given uh, to the customer, marketing and installation costs and maintenance and so on and so forth. But these must be weighed relative to market penetration goals, um, given the other challenges in designing an effective integrated program. So what we're saying is, if your market penetration goal is one or two or three percent a year, fine, you can impose some costs and potentially even ride the replacement market curve um, on the thermostat side. But if your market penetration goals are significantly above that, um, you know, these kinds of um, costs can inhibit um, uh, participation and program goals. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. So on this topic of transparency, I think what we can say is that it's a requirement in today's um, always interactive world. You know, any program communication should tell it like it is as a basic principle of its design. In some of our research and discussions, and this is kind of surprising, uh, but nevertheless, we have come across suggestions that the integrated DR energy efficiency offer should be promoted as a lifestyle um, offering, focusing on mobility and minimizing the DR component. In our years of experience in this space, we can say that would be a mistake. Uh, most customers leave programs if there is a disconnect between expectations and actual experience. So setting those expectations up front is critical. Um, in the case of Duke Home Energy Manager as well as Fort Collins Peak Partners, both communicated both EE and DR components of their offer in the interest of transparency, which is, which is great. Um, and as we have said, you know, understanding your customer base is key to program design. And be prepared to be honest and comprehensive in your communication. Um, but whether it's a new or existing program, with energy efficiency and DR, you need to decide what would be the most compelling to engage and retain the customers you have chosen to target. Um, so net-net, what we're saying is messaging coherence and an offer that resonates with the customers are important elements of the design. In our experience, um, convenience and savings are key messages. Environment and lifestyle are secondary messages. And um, I'm talking about messaging and marketing. Let's go to the next slide. And I believe that's my um, final slide.
a good uh, program design still requires a strong marketing and distribution strategy. Sometimes the marketing function receives uh, short shrift in the utility world. Consequently, program participation suffers. Um, and we know that marketing sets the pace of any uh, program um, deployment. Weak marketing with an otherwise strong program design will still not get enrollment results. In our experience, use of data and developing a segmentation-based messaging strategy is critical. Um, one more thing we can share. Customers appreciate choice. And I think Steve um, talked about that briefly. You know, can you offer optional technology, um, outdoor switch versus an indoor T-stat uh, for the thermostat or a water heater um, uh, program? Um, and I think Steve mentioned that both columns will introduce a water heater program later. Potentially Duke might as well at some point. Um, or can you offer different cycling strategies? And I think, you know, as Steve mentioned, there is a finesse. You know, got to make sure that you don't overwhelm the customer, perhaps do it in a phased manner. And finally, uh, deploy appropriate channels based on market penetration goals. And that's a key learning as well. Um, we can't rely on one or two major channels to meet the market penetration goals. In fact, market penetration goals determine what kind of channels will be used. And, and some will be introduced simultaneously and some over time. Um, and, and my last thought is uh, your strategy for deployment is really where the rubber meets the road. With that, let me give it back to Steve. Hey, thanks a lot, Praveen. Um, I wanted to quickly hit a few conclusions here, and then we'll go on to the questions. We've already gotten a lot of great questions, so thank you for that. And Praveen, thank you for giving me a second to prepare some answers. <laughs> um, so our, the conclusions are, are very clear. Um, one, you know, we think there's a ton of potential in integrated EE and DR programs. Number one, did you maximize the value by delivering both outcomes from the same customer? The, you lower the program cost because you're only marketing one program, installing one device, and operating one program on an ongoing basis. And then there's all the benefits of lowering customer confusion. You're getting the highest quality and value outcome off that one program. So you don't need to um, push other engagement programs on that customer. Um, we, we see connected thermostats as the clear nexus for these integrated EE and DR uh, customer engagement programs um, because they provide uh, such a convenient, comfortable experience. I mean, we've all seen, you know, Nest advertising during the Super Bowl. There's clearly a significant pool here for um, uh, these devices. And really importantly as well, if you get your devices, you the utility, or your partner's devices in that home in conjunction with one of your demand-side resource programs, you've not only got that resource, but you've uh, effectively prevented yourself from being disintermediated by a third party that may or may not be willing to participate or, and deliver the outcomes you're interested in. So really see, you know, as you've got this growing adoption of this technology, there is a bit of a land grab that's got to happen. Um, and utilities can offer a really unique value proposition if they, if they act properly. Um, bring your own device. Obviously, that's a big cost driver, uh, lower cost driver, and a really compelling technology that utilities are uh, incredibly interested in, and there's a lot of top-down pressure. Uh, but what we keep seeing is pilots that aren't built to scale or deliver, deliver real results. And um, we think that the, the future of bring your own device is got to be um, focused on the actual value those devices bring so that this can really capitalize on its potential in the marketplace. So huge resource, um, but we've got to execute better as an industry to deliver the value. And then finally, um, with the real-time data coming off of connected devices or near, near real-time and, and two-way switches, we can start moving uh, DSM programs up the, val the, the resource stack uh, because it really is quick response, uh, high predictability. Um, I think a great example I used earlier is we are now using our two-way devices to deliver sync reserve in the PJM market. Um, you know, so we're, you know, we're on par with spinning reserves. And there's a lot of other outcomes in the market that we can we can achieve. And these two-way devices that also deliver EE are the 
are the best tool to get there. So this is um, wrapping up our section. There's a question that just came in that I think is, is kind of worth asking uh, or answering to put a cap on this, that absolutely this technology works for small commercial, but there are different constraints in both how you um, enroll customers and how you operate the program. So that's something to leave for another day, but we'd be happy to answer offline. Uh, but you know, a lot of this does apply to small commercial, and we have a lot of experience delivering these types of programs to small commercial customers. Um, now, I have a few questions that I'm going to answer and then kick it over to Praveen for him to answer a couple as well. Um, one, um, in what capacity has the smart meter added value to something like the integrated EE and DR programs? That's a great question. Even with a two-way thermostat, AMI data uh, provides a lot of leverage. Um, both to optimize the program and give a better experience. For example, on the EE side, you know, we're with the connected device, we're just focused on HVAC, which is a you know obviously a huge driver of usage in the home. But with AMI data, we can disaggregate uh, consumption information and provide more appliance level and other efficiency tips and recommendations, or recommend other programs the utilities running that don't relate directly to the HVAC. So there's there's definite value there. Um, from a DR perspective, uh, you know, I think I mentioned this, the AMI data can really breathe new life into one-way devices, which is something we're doing with a lot of our utility partners. Um, you know, if you've got, uh, if you've got a one-way paging switch in the ground and it's providing you megawatts, um, maybe, the, maybe the right call is to, to ride that five or six more years, um, but with some two-way data we can provide, off the AMI switch we can provide some uh, a better quality DR experience and identify any offline devices. And of course, depending on the incentive program you have around DR, AMI data can be another channel of uh, data to use in settling uh, events with your customers. So uh, we absolutely love when we can have AMI data, but one of the beauty of these connected devices is you can maybe get to 80% of the value or, or even more without having that interval data. Um, Another question, a uh, great one. Are you, are you seeing utilities moving from classic device-driven DR programs to data-driven behavioral DR programs? Um, there's absolutely a, a growing buzz about that in the marketplace, and we're watching it carefully. Um, you know, our DNA as Converge, as I mentioned up front, is paper performance contracts where we enter into 10-year-plus deals and, and offset a transmission line or a, or a peaker. And that's the lens we look at. So for us, it's all about is it predictable, sustainable, high quality megawatts that we can count on. So, um, so we're watching the behavioral nudges. Um, you know, right now it's you know it's just the data is not there that it's it's of that level of quality. But what we are doing is taking some of the behavioral best practices and rolling it into a device program, which we believe is ultimately the best best of all worlds. Um, you get that device control, that direct access to data. Um, but you use behavioral science and multi-channel engagement to get um, an optimal outcome. Um, the, the other great thing about behavioral programs in general is it's an opt-out program that hits uh, a lot of customers. It can be a great tool to promote customers into uh, a, de a, you know, a device-enabled program that's going to deliver higher quality outcomes. Um, another question we have, which is <laughs> something we are dealing with every day. Um, with the multitude of device brands available in the market, how are you integrating with this diversity? So this is a, a great question and a, just an ongoing challenge. Um, utilities are seeing these devices in the marketplace. They're getting a lot of uh, external pressure or board level pressure to figure out a way to work with these providers and incorporate them into the program. Um, it's something that we absolutely support and embrace. Um, we're a big fan of open standards and we, we you know we we joke internally we want to be Switzerland, you know, <laughs> in the device world and work with anybody. Um, but uh, in doing that we see utilities as a really critical catalyst to make this work. Um, the one huge issue that I've mentioned a couple of times is how do we value these different resources. Um, we need to understand the constraints on that on the load 
um, you know, in terms of how, when we can call it, what kind of notification, how long the event is, the properties of the event, you know, are there penalties for under and over delivering? Uh, you know, there's a lot of market constraints that are on utilities for how they deliver capacity into the market um, or other providers' capacity into the market that are very disconnected with the way a lot of third-party providers want to engage. Um, so right now we're trying to work with our utility partners and our uh, partners uh, in the device space to bridge that gap and make those market constraints more transparent uh, and value value the resources accordingly and let the market sort itself out. You know, there's a uh, let's let's pay. I think you know our our philosophy is let's pay someone for the actual load they deliver and its value in the market, not just the, you know, whatever flat fee they're asking for. Um, so I think we're making a lot of progress there, and this is a really critical, um, a critical driver to helping bring your own device actually deliver on its promise. Um, that was a long, rambling answer to that one. Um, I hope I hit all the points on it. Um, if, if not, and you want to ask follow-ups, please, uh, please do so. We either get to them today or, or try to get back to you offline. Um, there was one other question I just wanted to, there's an easy, a quick answer. That someone asked about the TRC of 6.25 in PEPCO. That was, um, they asked if that was driven by the device DR and the behavioral EE, it was actually, that's from device DR plus um, device EE. So doing the, what we would consider the moving the behavioral onto the thermostat portal uh, so it's more actionable and the, you know, the more, the more relevant insights that come from the runtime data off the thermostat. So um, I've probably talked too much. Uh, Praveen, would you like to address a couple of questions? Sure, um, Steve. Um, Thanks. Um, I think I've seen about um, a couple of questions. I think three of them I can uh, take. Um, the first one is actually a pretty simple one, uh, which um, I think, well, my apologies, we didn't clarify. We had used the term BRC in our presentation um, in my section, and BRC really stands for business reply card. So I think it was in the context of um, you know, keeping it simple for customers to qualify and, uh, you know, whether it's on the website or it is a call center or if you're sending a, a mailer at home, um, the business reply card would have to have enough information so that customers can qualify. You don't want customers to sign up and then later on realize that uh, they, don't, they are not qualified. So I think that's what, you know, we're trying to make sure that targeting is good and that's where utilities can use the data that's available and overlay it with some of the other information they can um, get from the outside and buy um, and, um, and be smart in their targeting. So, so my apologies on the BRC. Uh, we'll clarify that um, in future presentations. Uh, spell it out. The second question is um, about what are the different messages that resonate with customers? Um, what works in the um, as, as we have done several programs across um, the country with different utilities, what are the different messages and teams that work? And I think, um, let me sort of carve that out into two or three different categories. One is, in the context of DR and EE, what we find is that uh, customers care about convenience and they care about savings. So if you are introducing or thinking of launching a program um, an integrated program, then those are the themes that customers will most resonate to. Um, you know, if the DR component and through the energy efficiency that you can talk about savings, that's great. The mobility aspect provides convenience to customers, the ability to um, on the spot, even remotely opt out of an event, for instance, uh, you know, that's available, that's great. So in our mind, those Two are the key uh, messaging themes for uh, an integrated program. Um, in the environment uh, and lifestyle uh, are secondary messages. They are, um, you know, not, in our experience, DR-centric messaging sometimes includes um, environment, and we treat that for a certain segment of the population. But in this particular case, 
Um, the integrated case, we are looking at uh, giving it a second uh, billing and not a primary billing. Um, going to the DR-centric world and residential especially, um, you know, we typically segment our customers. Uh, generally, one message does not work for all. Um, there are some customers for whom uh, money is not an issue and they want to do something that's right for the environment. Um, right for the, um, uh, I guess, reliability, especially on the commercial side, small commercial customers, um, look for that. Uh, and then there are some customers who, for whom money is a primary motivator. For them, incentives are, are important. So I think we rotate some of these messages, in, in, and more importantly, we actually segment our customers. Um, but I think that's the key insight is that, you know, not all messages are going to work with everybody. Um, you got to be able to do the market segmentation, figure out what message is the right one to position uh, to that customer and, uh, and, and do it that way. Um, this other question is about, um, you talked about the role of incentives in a DR and energy efficiency program. Would thermostat be enough of an incentive? And I think this is a question that we have actually been asked um, a, a lot. Uh, in our other discussions with different utilities as well. And, and it has to do with cost effectiveness and we understand the rationale as to why this comes up. And the insight here is that if we are talking about an energy efficiency program, a thermostat is a great incentive. Uh, and when I say a thermostat, in today's world, I'm talking a thermostat as well as um, um, an app that comes with it you know, so that there's mobility. I mean, the customers today are used to uh, or expect that. So that's the cost of doing business. So if we just offer a stat, uh, if you are starting to launch a program today, that will not be sufficient. Uh, we need to include um, uh, an app with that. Having said that, if you're talking about demand response programs or demand response and integrated uh, DREE programs, a stat is not a sufficient incentive unless your market penetration goal is uh, very modest. If you're trying to achieve a three to five or seven percent market penetration, then you can, you know, ride the replacement market um, curve and attract those customers, and they'll go for the free stat. Um, uh, but of course, they'll have to participate in the DR program as well. So from that, our experience has been that if your market penetration goals are significantly higher than the modest three, four, five, seven percent then you need to include other um, incentives as well, especially for the DR components. Otherwise, you'll not be able to um, meet your um, market penetration goals. Steve, let me stop here. Um, why don't you uh, take, um, if you have some other questions that have come up in the interim. All right, yeah, thank you. There's a couple great ones that just came in. Uh, someone asked, uh, that there, you know, I mentioned penalties for over-delivering on performance promises. Did we mean that there are penalties for you for saving more than promised? Um, well, this is a that's a great question, and um, when you're dealing, depending on the market, um, if you commit to, a, you know, you commit as a resource, um, if you if you don't deliver at least 80 percent of what you committed, in in some markets you don't get paid, or if you over-deliver. Um, relative to what you committed, then there are penalties that apply to the payment. Uh, and those are penalties that can be imposed on utilities or other providers of load. And that's, um, you know, that's, that's something that a lot of the third-party providers are pretty disconnected from. So they are not either willing or able to say how many devices are online or available. It's just a, you know, I have up to this amount, you give me a day ahead notice and I will call this event. Um, so that's, those are the kind of disconnections that I think we need to close to make bring your own devices really effective. You know, if I've got a third party that isn't isn't able to be a very reliable load, then um, we're going to have to lower the value. Um, and I think that right now that's been a lot of cold water, frankly, that <laughs> they haven't liked um, liked receiving. That hey, you know, a lot of folks are entering the market saying, "Well, I'm going to be getting." 50 or 75 bucks a year for infinity for every device, you know, that I can get in the market from the utility. And I think we're saying, well, the market doesn't really work that way. Um, and let's let's help bridge the gaps and see if we can get you to a, 
an event um, shape that aligns to enough market value so that everyone is happy. So that's the, the gap we're trying to close. Um, another great question, uh, there's a couple questions that I think uh, could be tied together. One is, um, is there a role for states in helping develop DR and E programs? And another question about regulatory support to help drive these programs in light of states uh, pulling back on EE. Um, that's a fantastic question and something that's really critical to getting uh, these programs in market. Um, the first thing that I think we all need to do is, on the state level, work to break down barriers between EE and DR programs to allow for a joint accounting of the benefits. That's something we see in different forms sometimes at the utility level, more often at the state level, where trying to get an EEDR program through the, you know, the, the approval processes and it, with, with uh, different, uh, different stakeholders uh, approving budgets on different three-year cycles, you know, can be an absolute nightmare to get something like this through. And that's really not in the best interest of the rate payers or the reliability of the grid. So there's obvious, and I think these problems are obvious to everyone, uh, but as always on the regulatory side, um, actually getting to the right outcome can be really challenging. So that is absolutely first and foremost, um, I think the most critical issue there. And then below that, there's a lot of other issues, um, you know, that, that pop up at the state level. And this is where it probably is, is worth uh, you know, taking it more to a one-off level. But, you know, there's concerns about privacy and accessibility, and, um, you know, there's a lot of different things that can pop up from the regulatory side that need to be need to be addressed. Um, but are all easily, you know, I shouldn't say, they're all surmountable with the right, uh, especially with the right alignment from counterparties engaging in that state. So um, there's a lot to do there, but again, I think number one is absolutely to identify barriers and work with uh, work within the system to break those down. And barriers, of, I mean EEDR barriers. Okay, I think um, we are uh, just about ready to wrap it up. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating. Um, it was it was a real pleasure to speak to everyone. Um, the questions were fantastic. Um, there's a lot of other questions we didn't get to. Um, we're going to try and follow up with those offline. Uh, as you can see on the screen showing right now, you have Praveen and, and my contact information, and we'd love to hear from you all. And we'd love to see you at Distributech. We're going to be out there next week in uh, San Diego. So thank you again for your time, and I'll turn it over to the moderator. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, Praveen. Great presentation. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed today's discussion. As you log off, please take a moment to complete our survey and give us your feedback so we can continue to provide you with quality content. Thank you for attending. This concludes today's presentation.